itu tadi gambar-gambar maksudnya apa? Semua perkataan Jin. Wah, Lur. In the heart of a tranquil village, my community service program assignment took an unexpected turn as I encountered a captivating dancer. Her graceful movements seemed to hold the key to the village's deep mysteries, stirring a sense of curiosity within me. Determined to uncover the truth, I embarked on a thrilling journey that blurred the boundaries between reality and the unknown. With each step, I found myself drawn deeper into a world of enchantment and secrets waiting to be unraveled. As I unraveled the threads of the dancer's enigma, the village revealed hidden wonders and eerie occurrences. The dance became a portal to a realm of mysticism, where the lines between ordinary and extraordinary blur. With an unyielding spirit, I set forth, ready to delve into the captivating dance of mystery and uncover the hidden truths that awaited me. As the end of 2009 approached, my fellow classmates and I were nearing the completion of the requirements for the community service program. It was an opportunity for us to engage in community service and further our thesis assignments, with various villages serving as our learning grounds. The campus was abuzz with excitement, but amidst the enthusiastic faces, I felt a sense of detachment. I, Widya, was still anxious because I hadn't found a place for the community service course. Just when I began to worry, a phone call came to my rescue. The voice on the other end explained that they had discovered a village in Indonesia that would be suitable for our community service program. A wave of relief washed over me as I immediately submitted a proposal for the community service program. After careful consideration, all the decisions regarding the community service program were approved. Our group consisted of two faculties, and we had both group and individual work programs. Alongside Noor, Ayu, Wahyu, Anton, and Bima, I was going to embark on this community service journey that would span approximately six weeks. The anticipation and eagerness welled up within me as I prepared for the adventure ahead. Saying farewell to my parents, I embarked on the journey to the community service program. My parents were curious about the location of the program. Concern filled my mother's eyes as she worried about the condition of the place which was situated in a village surrounded by a dense forest. It wasn't an ideal living environment for humans. However, I reassured them by explaining that thorough observations had been conducted, and it was deemed relatively safe. Reluctantly, my parents had no choice but to agree. And so, the day came for us to leave. We boarded a minibus, ready to venture into the unknown. The plan was to be picked up by villagers at a forest road near the village. Excitement and apprehension mingled within me as we embarked on this new chapter of our journey. Following Noor's instructions, the car came to a halt at the entrance of Forest D, a journey of about four to five hours from the city of S. It was growing late, and the proximity to the forest made visibility challenging. To add to the atmosphere, a light drizzle began to fall. After waiting for what felt like an eternity, a faint light emerged in the distance. It turned out to be six weathered-looking men, their motorcycles worn and weary. In the midst of the drizzle and the muddy roads, surrounded by towering trees, they embarked on a journey with the sound of motorcycles that seemed on the verge of crashing, causing Widya to question their safety once more. Time seemed to crawl as the motorcycles pressed on, delving further into the heart of the forest. Widya longed for this arduous journey to reach its conclusion swiftly. Amidst the silence, the riders remained tight-lipped, but it is often said that in moments of quiet solitude, secrets are securely guarded. Suddenly, shattering the stillness, the distant rumble of a motorcycle reverberated through the air. It carried a melody so familiar,
the gentle hum of Javanese traditional instruments entwined gracefully with the enchanting notes of gamelan. As the faint echoes gradually dissipated, a wooden gate materialized before their eyes, extending a warm welcome to their final destination. We finally arrived at Unknown Village, where we would dedicate ourselves to the community service program for the next six weeks. Ayu introduced us to Mr. Prabhu, a man with a thick mustache who happened to be a friend of Ayu's sister. Mr. Prabhu kindly shared the history of his village with me when I asked. I couldn't help but wonder why his village seemed so far away. To my surprise, Mr. Prabhu responded that the village wasn't far at all, as the journey would only take around 30 minutes. I felt confused, and my friends exchanged questioning glances. Mr. Prabhu suggested that we rest in the provided space. The men were assigned to a small shack that had served as a village hospital. Though it had a dirt floor, there was a bed laid on a mat inside. The women, on the other hand, stayed in one of the residents' houses. As we settled in our room, I shared my confusion with Mr. Prabhu about the duration of our journey. In my experience, it had taken over an hour to reach the village. I also asked Ayu if she had heard the distant sound of gamelan during our earlier trip. Ayu simply replied that there might have been a street celebration happening at the time. The mystery of the journey and the faint melodies continued to linger in my mind. Unlike Ayu, Nor looked at me in horror as he spoke softly. Nor shared a chilling belief held by the village elders that hearing the sound of gamelan in such a place could foreshadow a dreadful omen. Ayu scoffed, accusing Nor of speaking nonsense. Yet, Nor insisted, recounting how he had not only heard the eerie melodies but also witnessed a haunting figure dancing amidst the shadows of the forest path. Feeling a shiver crawl down their spines, I urgently implored Nor to silence the tale and refrain from sharing it with the others. They were mere guests in the village, and the last thing they wanted was to disturb the spirits dwelling there. Nor could only nod, silently acknowledging the gravity of the situation. The following day, the group assembled as promised by Mr. Prabhu. It was time to venture into the village, exploring the work programs Ayu had submitted while seeking suggestions for individual projects. Their first destination sent chills down their spines, the village cemetery. Each tombstone stood ominously, veiled in black cloth, surrounded by gnarled banyan trees. A sense of foreboding hung in the air, intensified by the sight of large rocks placed beside the trees. Before the tombstones lay complete offerings, as if appeasing the restless souls. Curiosity mingled with unease, Widya mustered the courage to inquire about the black-clothed tombstones. Pak Prabhu's response carried a haunting undertone, it was a funeral rite called Sankarso, indicating a grave. The air grew heavier as Pak Prabhu emphasized the importance of showing utmost respect to the resting place of the departed, warning against any missteps. A shudder ran through the group as they continued their journey, the cemetery's eerie presence lingering in their minds. The next place we visited was the Sindan, a fascinating pond where water emerged from beneath the ground. Pak Prabhu believed it held great promise for our work program. Not far from there, a river flowed peacefully. Pak Prabhu had a vision of connecting the Sindan and the river, creating a unique waterway. However, as our journey continued, I couldn't help but notice several peculiarities that sent shivers down my spine. The most striking of them all was the frequent discovery of winnowing bowls adorned with offerings, flowers, food, and the lingering fragrance of incense. It left a lasting impression on me, evoking a sense of mystery. But nothing prepared me for what lay ahead, the dreaded Tapak Tilas. Pak Prabhu warned us that it was a boundary strictly off-limits to groups of children. The path itself seemed haphazardly constructed, with complete red cloths tied to yellow coconut leaves on either side, reminiscent of a wedding ceremony. The sight sent a chill down my spine, stirring a mix of curiosity and fear. What secrets and dangers lurked beyond this forbidden threshold? Goosebumps ran down my spine as I gazed at those eerie footpaths. Our observation came to an end as Pak Prabhu led us back to his house. As we returned, Wahyu and Anton inquired about the location of the bathroom. 
Pak Prabhu directed them to a cubicle by the Sindhan, nestled next to the river, equipped with a large jug for bathing. In that moment, a thought struck me, I decided to venture to the bathroom in the cubicle next to the Sindhan. At first, Nor seemed reluctant, but eventually, he reluctantly agreed. The Sindhan building resembled a miniature temple, with a square pool of murky water covered in moss. The booth stood adjacent to a towering tamarind tree, casting a sinister shadow. Though hesitant, I urged myself forward. To my surprise, the booth contained a large jug filled with water. Nor stepped inside while I waited by the booth's entrance. It was then that I noticed the faint scent of incense wafting through the air. Intrigued, I followed the fragrance and discovered offerings placed beside the formidable tamarind tree. What chilled me to the bone was the sight of freshly burned incense coals. Fear and shock engulfed me as I hurriedly returned to the cubicle's door. From within, the sound of water ceased, and my calls to Nor went unanswered. A profound silence hung in the air. Suddenly, a faint and melodic voice reached my ears, compelling me to press my ear against the cubicle door. It was a soft, haunting melody, akin to a Javanese song, sung with delicate sweetness. Instinctively, I called out to Noor, pounding on the wooden door, but there was no response. The strange voice continued to serenade from within. Panicked, I called out louder, desperately banging on the door. Finally, the door swung open, revealing a startled Noor. He saw the fear etched on my face and quickly urged me to bathe while he stood guard outside, keeping watch over the eerie surroundings. Breathless, I hurriedly entered the room and slammed the door shut. The air inside the booth was heavy with dampness, and black moss clung to the wooden surfaces. In front of me stood a large jug, its water level diminishing alongside a coconut shell dipper with a handle intricately woven from tendrils of teak. With trembling hands, I began to undress, my mind still haunted by the haunting ballad that echoed in my ears. As I stole a quick glance around the booth, a shiver raced down my spine, I was not alone. It felt as though a presence lurked in the shadows, watching me intently, scrutinizing every inch of my being. The figure before me had the visage of a strikingly beautiful woman, yet I couldn't fathom who she might be. Standing before the jug, clad only in my outdated garments, I reached for the first scoop of water to cleanse my body. The chill of the water sent shivers cascading down my spine, and with each splash upon my head, I found myself involuntarily closing my eyes. In those moments of darkness, the image of the enigmatic woman's radiant smile filled my thoughts, captivating me in an inexplicable way. Fear coursed through my veins as I questioned her presence. Was she a spirit, a vengeful ghost seeking something from me? Or perhaps she was a manifestation of my own fears, a figment of my imagination playing tricks on me in this eerie setting. Who was she? What did she want from me? As I stood there, vulnerable and exposed, the unanswered questions swirled in my mind, amplifying my unease. It was as if a dark secret was concealed within her lovely features, waiting to be unraveled. As I stepped out of the booth, the faint sound of the chant reached my ears once more. It sent shivers down my spine, and I couldn't ignore the unease that settled deep within me. Slowly, I turned my gaze towards Noor, who stood alone outside the room. Her eyes met mine, filled with disbelief and confusion. Unable to contain my curiosity, I mustered the courage to ask her about the Javanese songs I had heard during my shower. I needed to know if it was her voice that had been singing, echoing through the air. But as my question hung in the air, 
nor simply stared at me in silence, her expression unreadable. A heavy silence enveloped us, and it felt as though something significant remained unsaid. I searched for answers in Nor's eyes, hoping to find a trace of truth or explanation. Yet, she remained tight-lipped, refusing to acknowledge my inquiry. With a heavy heart, I watched as Nor turned away, leaving me alone with my unanswered questions. It was clear that something mysterious and unsettling was unfolding, but Nor's silence only added to the mounting tension. I couldn't shake off the feeling that there was more to her than met the eye. As I walked home that evening, glancing at Nora's retreating figure, I couldn't help but wonder what secrets she held, and why she had chosen to keep them hidden from me. The unanswered question continued to linger, fueling my growing sense of unease and foreboding. Night fell, and the village relied on kerosene lamps after the generators stopped. Nor had retired, leaving Ayu and me to work on our progress. Ayu's revelation about an old studio near Tapak Tila's intrigued me. Shadows danced on its weathered walls, tempting us to explore its mysteries. Our imaginations sparked with anticipation, hinting at the adventure that awaited us. As we continued our work, the allure of the studio lingered, promising a journey that would forever alter our path. I couldn't help but voice my disagreement with Ayu's actions. It troubled me deeply. However, Ayu stood firm, recounting how Bima had encountered a mesmerizing woman who vanished into thin air upon closer inspection. With the night growing late, I retreated to my room, where I discovered Nor peacefully asleep. Ayu followed suit, seeking refuge in the realm of dreams. But as the stillness settled upon the house, an unsettling symphony of footsteps pierced the air. My eyes widened in disbelief as I witnessed the impossible, Nor's silhouette slipping out from his slumbering state. Should I awaken Ayu or confront this enigma alone? With a mix of fear and determination, I mustered the courage to rise from my bed. Each step I took was filled with uncertainty as I embarked on the pursuit of Nor's mysterious figure. The house was engulfed in darkness, and it felt as if the residents were lost in a deep slumber. Before me stood the wide open door, a gateway to the unknown. The atmosphere grew heavy with anticipation as I cautiously ventured forth, my heart racing with a blend of apprehension and an insatiable curiosity. I frantically scanned the surroundings, searching for any sign of Nor. My heart skipped a beat as I laid eyes on her, standing right in front of me in the field. Nor moved with a mesmerizing grace, her bare feet gliding across the ground as if she were a professional dancer. Nor, I called out, but she seemed oblivious to my presence. She continued her fluid movements, occasionally casting horrified glances in my direction. A chill crawled up my spine as her gaze met mine. In the distance, the rhythmic beats of drums echoed once more, intensifying my fear. The haunting melodies of the gamelan intertwined with Nor's dance, as if they were inextricably linked. It was a haunting sight that sent shivers down my spine. Finally, I mustered the courage to demand that Nor halt her dance. I shouted, desperate for her to stop behaving so strangely. It was at that moment that Nor's face transformed into something truly terrifying. Her eyes sharpened, almost entirely consumed by darkness. My scream tore through the air, uncontrollable and filled with sheer terror. Suddenly, Wahyu gripped me tightly, shaking me while calling my name. I saw his bewildered and frightened expression, as if he couldn't comprehend what was happening. My screams jolted everyone from their slumber, including the house's owner, who appeared concerned. But my attention remained fixated on Noor, who had just vanished, leaving me and everyone else stunned. As our gazes met, a shared sense of bewilderment enveloped us. We stood there, locked in a moment of disbelief. The weight of the inexplicable encounter lingered in the air, casting a shadow of unease upon us all. The incident reached its climax with Wahyu's narrative. Initially, he had gone to the terrace to smoke a cigarette and seek some solitude. Little did he know that he would stumble upon a mesmerizing sight, a lone figure dancing gracefully in the field. Intrigued, 
Wahyu drew closer, only to discover that it was me, Widya, twirling and swaying with an ethereal grace. As Wahyu recounted his experience, a profound silence engulfed the room. Everyone's eyes were fixed on him, their expressions a mixture of astonishment and bewilderment. Yet, there was something unspoken, something that Wahyu chose to keep to himself for now. He promised to reveal the missing piece of the puzzle when the time was right, adding to the intrigue that already hung heavily in the air. We all gathered at Pak Prabhu's behest, ready to shed light on the sequence of events. His curiosity was palpable, evident in the creases on his forehead and the intense gaze he cast upon me. Pak Prabhu was particularly fascinated by my impromptu dance performance, considering that I had never received any formal training. The mystery of my inexplicable talent lingered, waiting to be unraveled, as we delved deeper into the enigma that surrounded me. That day, Pak Prabhu asked Ayu, Wahyu, and me to accompany him to someone's house. We rode in Ayu's car, following a familiar path. It was strange, though. This time, it felt like we reached the main road in less than an hour, maybe even just 30 minutes. The surroundings were desolate, and the house we arrived at stood alone in the wilderness. As we approached, an elderly man, who seemed to be expecting us, stood in front of the house. Pak Prabhu called him Ba Boyat. Ba Boyat is a term commonly used in Javanese culture to refer to an elderly figure, often considered as a wise and respected individual. Despite Pak Prabhu's explanation, Ba Boyat's expression remained indifferent. In a raspy voice, Ba Boyat went inside the house and returned with five cups of coffee. He offered us the coffee, and something about his eerie smile made me hesitate. But curiosity got the better of me, and I decided to take a sip. The coffee was strangely sweet, with a subtle hint of jasmine fragrance. Without realizing it, I found myself emptying the cup, intrigued by its peculiar taste. Not just me, everyone was urged to taste the coffee prepared by Mba Bayat. Reluctantly, we all took a sip. Wahyu and Ayu's reactions were extreme, they were shocked and spat out the coffee. Their faces showed confusion as the taste was not just bitter, but extremely bitter. To our surprise, Pak Prabhu drank the coffee without any fuss. Mba Boyat then explained that the coffee had different flavors. He used the smoothest Javanese coffee beans. Some flavors were meant for dancers and caretakers, while others were indigestible. Suddenly, Mba Boyat pointed directly at me with a serious expression. Pak Prabhu attentively listened and then bid farewell to return home. Before leaving, Mba Boyat applied turmeric paste on my forehead, cautioning others to take care of me. The coffee served earlier, called Irang coffee, was a specially formulated brew. It wasn't meant for humans. Those who hadn't tasted it would undoubtedly spit it out. However, for those with a softer palate like me, the coffee tasted sweet. The children stared at me in silence. But Pak Prabhu quickly changed the subject and revealed that another entity was following me. It was crucial that I was never left alone. To address this, Pak Prabhu had a plan. Starting tonight, we would all live in one house, with only a partition of woven bamboo separating us. Our new dwelling was located at the far end, a spacious place that used to belong to a migrating family. Behind the house, there stood a significant black stone, surrounded by banana trees and young shoots. Wahyu shared something with me that he had kept hidden for a while. He opened up about his concerns regarding Bhima's mysterious actions at night and how it could impact our real work class assignments. According to Wahyu, Bhima would frequently leave the house without explanation, only to return in the early morning. He also mentioned overhearing Bhima talking to himself in his room, which piqued his curiosity. I couldn't help but feel skeptical about what Wahyu revealed. The idea of Bhima's peculiar behavior and secretive outings seemed far-fetched and unsettling. It left me wondering about the truth behind it all and whether there was more to the situation than met the eye. The unknown and mysterious nature of Bhima's actions filled me with both curiosity and apprehension. Nightfall enveloped the house, and we gathered together, each occupied with our own activities. Nor retreated to the room for prayers, while Ayu, Wahyu, Anton, and I engaged in lively conversation on the terrace. Meanwhile, 
Bhima had an important meeting with Pak Prabhu. In the midst of our evening, a haunting melody echoed from the kitchen, capturing our attention. Curiosity beckoned me towards the source of the sound. As I passed through a room where Noor was in deep prayer, the melody grew louder and clearer. I pushed aside the curtain and caught sight of Noor sipping water from a jug, still adorned in her prayer attire. Our eyes locked in an intense moment of connection. Before I could react, Noor approached me, and a sudden surge of fear propelled me to run. In my haste, I scanned the room, only to find it empty of Noor. Confused and trembling, I turned to my side, and there stood Noor, gripping my shoulder. A chilling sensation crawled through my veins, and I was unable to find my voice. My friends, alarmed by my strange behavior, surrounded me with questions, seeking an explanation for my silence and trembling hands. In an attempt to ease my distress, Bhima requested Noor to fetch a drink for me. She returned with the same jug I had witnessed earlier, and I obediently drank from it. An eerie silence fell upon me once again, perplexing everyone around. Holding the teapot in my left hand, I raised my right hand to my mouth. Slowly, I extracted something from within. Two or three strands of long, black hair. They emerged from my mouth, causing a collective gasp among us. In that moment, the teapot's lid was opened, revealing a single strand of hair immersed in water. It was a hair that did not belong to Noor, as she confirmed she had not encountered any in her own mouth while drinking. Bewilderment filled the air as we tried to comprehend the unsettling occurrence, leaving us with a lingering sense of unease. I couldn't help but vomit uncontrollably. The tension in the air was thick, and Anton claimed that I was being targeted by spirits, subjected to their bewitching powers. The sign of hair attempting to enter my body further fueled my anxiety. I fell ill for three agonizing days, confined to the mat in the room. During that time, I was often left alone in the house, and it was during my sickness that a haunting incident occurred, forever etched in my memory. It all began when I lay on the mat, believing that no one else was present in the house. However, that afternoon, I heard the sound of something being struck. At first, I tried to dismiss it, but its persistence became unbearable. The sound emanated from the back of the house, near the kitchen. Curiosity got the better of me, and I ventured towards the source. As I approached the wooden door of the kitchen, I hesitated, peering through the crack. What I witnessed left me utterly perplexed. Amidst the banana trees stood a mysterious figure, approximately fifty years old, dressed in black garments resembling those of a gardener. His gaze seemed fixated on the house that served as my lodging during the community service program. Uncertainty lingered in the air, and fear gripped my heart. After a few minutes, the enigmatic figure departed from the spot, and a sense of relief washed over me. Unbeknownst to me, Anton had just entered the house as we crossed paths foolishly, I kept the encounter to myself, failing to share the peculiar sighting with Anton and the others. Little did I know that the following day, the same eerie incident would repeat itself. With the familiar loud sound echoing once more, I cautiously peered again. This time, the strange people displayed greater audacity. He scanned his surroundings, drawing closer to the inn and attempting to sneak a glimpse multiple times. His movements conveyed ill intentions, leaving me puzzled as to what he sought in this place. As I pondered this, a sudden realization struck me, I was alone in this house. And just as this thought consumed me, a voice startled me, accompanied by a deafening noise originating from the rock behind the kitchen. The sound was so powerful that it sent the strange people fleeing in a frantic rush. I witnessed it all unfold before my eyes. Someone had hurled a sizable rock into the river behind the house, triggering the strange people's panic-stricken retreat. Following suit, I hurriedly reported the incident to Pak Prabhu, who received the news with surprise. Efforts were made to locate the strange people, 
who turned out to be a resident of the village. When questioned about his presence at the community service program Children's Lodging, the strange people mumbled something about spotting a woman. This woman, according to him, wore attire akin to that of a lady's maid or a dancer, and she had entered the house. He claimed to have glimpsed her graceful dance in the kitchen. However, just moments before he beheld her face, the strange people was struck with terror. Behind the supposed beauty and innocence of the woman's facial features, he discovered a void, a flat and formless visage. Pak Prabhu merely cautioned him against further involvement and dismissed the strange people. During that day, I was diligently working on my delayed work program. Wahyu approached me, offering an opportunity to leave the village. He suggested that we head to the city to purchase equipment necessary for our work progress. Glancing at his watch, Wahyu realized it was already past 11 o'clock, and we needed to swiftly complete our tasks in the city. Prior to our departure, Pak Prabhu had warned us to return before evening. We embarked on the journey, following the path until we reached a major highway. Finally, we arrived in City B and made a stop at a market, diligently searching for all the items we needed. Once we had acquired what we were looking for, we hastened our return. Along the way, Wahyu made a stop at a gas station. It was already 4 p.m., and we were running late. Wahyu spotted me from a distance, standing beside a meatball vendor. When he reached me, we both bought some meatballs to satisfy our hunger. The meatball vendor advised us not to head home at that late hour. He expressed concern about the perilous condition of the forest during the night. The vendor cautioned us to keep moving while passing through the forest, avoid looking around, never halt our motorbike, and offer many prayers along the way. It was a word of caution we took to heart. Amidst the silence on the road, only the sound of their motorbike broke the stillness. There was no other rider in sight. Suddenly, their motorbike broke down, leaving them stranded. They continued their journey on foot, attempting to fix the motorbike along the way. Time seemed to stretch endlessly as they walked, desperately hoping to find someone who could assist them. Then, Wahyu's footsteps came to a halt. I stopped too, noticing something was amiss. Wahyu and I locked eyes, and I shared that I heard the sound of a wedding celebration nearby. Wahyu confirmed that he heard it too and reminded me of the meatball vendor's advice, to keep walking if we heard any sounds. Encouraged by his words, I resumed my steps, and the sound of the festivities grew louder as we went on. Laughter filled the air, indicating a joyous wedding celebration in close proximity. However, at this moment, both Wahyu and I hesitated. Should we continue our journey or give in to our curiosity, risking getting entangled in a haunting mystery? The decision weighed on us. The road ahead was long, and the outcome of our choice remained uncertain. Whittier's adventure continues, and the answers await us in the next chapter of the story. Chaka